Friends, we begin our discussion today with the key concept in political science, rather in political theory, that is the state. Now, all of us are quite familiar with the concept of state, but the problem is that in our everyday life, what we normally experience, what we come across, is the presence of government. And as a consequence, the man in the street generally confuses the state with the government. Now, it is a fact that state and government, they apparently look quite similar. They apparently uh, are believed to be quite similar expressions, but there is a crucial distinction between state and government, although the state and government, they do not stand in a relation of juxtaposition. And therefore, what we have to start with is, first of all, the concept of state and how the concept of state is different from the concept of government. Now, let us talk about the state like this. The state is an abstraction, while government is the concretization of the state. In other words, state actually symbolizes the idea of power, whereas it is through the government that the state is made operational. And therefore, state is a larger whole, while it also predates the idea of government. In other words, or to be more precise, it is the government which is the face of the state. Although we talk about state today, all of us are familiar with the idea of the modern state, which virtually represents the idea of a huge monstrous machine. It symbolizes power, it symbolizes might, it actually represents the idea of uh, force, violence, all these things are true. That is, we are in a way dwarfed by the power of the state. But the interesting thing is that the way the state, as we experience it today, it, the way it has emerged today, this was not the idea of the state when it first originated say, years ago. In fact, not just years ago, but thousands of years back. If one tries to trace the origin of the modern state, then you would be interested to know, and it's quite fascinating to learn, that the modern state as we experience it today, the modern state as we come across today in our daily life, well, it is just a product of a few hundred years, just a few centuries. That is, the modern state, it virtually emerged in Europe, and that was in the 17th century. But actually, the state as a symbol of power, the state as an institution, well, it originated, of course, in a very rudimentary form, not in its present form. But state as an institution, as a kind of political structure, well, it emerged about 3,000 years back, and that was in Mesopotamia. And not only in Mesopotamia, these things we will discuss later in other lectures, the rudimentary form of state we come across in certain parts of Asia, in certain parts of Africa, well, the notion of state, it developed. Why or how did this state develop? That is, in the holy past, when civilization had just begun. Now, how did the state begin? How did the state originate? There are, broadly speaking, two explanations, or rather, we can refer to two factors which very broadly explain the emergence of the state in the past. And one has to keep it in mind that this state is quite different from the modern state as we come across today as I have already explained, that the modern state, it is a product of 17th century Europe. Now, 
going back to those two points which I have already referred to, that is, these two points are first the the state as we see it today, as I have explained already, well, it goes back to the past. And the state in its original form, as I have already mentioned, it emerged in, in the Central Asia, in Mesopotamia, in certain other parts of Asia and Africa, in fact, in South America also, in Peru, one comes across the rudimentary form, the rudimentary structure, a very elementary form of state. Now, how did this kind of state develop? Why did the state develop? Now, the earliest, in the earliest phase of human civilization, well, people just moved about like nomads. But then, what they required was irrigation, settlement within a fixed te territory. And therefore, they required a kind of location. That is, they required, say, concentration of resources so that they could feed themselves. And once you require concentration of resources, then you require settlement. And once you require settlement, that settlement can last, that settlement can be stable only if there is an order. So we require an order, order means authority, and it is from this sense of creating an order, it is from this sense of instituting an authority that the idea of the state first emerged. Then one comes across another factor, that is religion. Religion is the other factor. I have already mentioned that there are two factors. The first was this need for settlement. The other is the second factor, that is religion. Now religion, all of us know, well, it was a necessity. It was a necessity in the sense that in the earliest phase of human civilization, well, man worshipped nature. And as worshippers of nature, well, man was in a way uh, terribly threatened by the forces of nature. And therefore, what happened was that some people, uh, you, call, you can call them priests, you can call them godmen, well, these people who claimed that they understood the secrets of nature. And by use of magical powers, they tried to exercise influence over the society, the kind of society which was born at that time. And therefore, they commanded respect. They commanded respect, and by commanding respect, well, these people, these godmen, these, these people who believed in magical powers, who could exercise magical powers, who uh, could somehow uh, use their uh, influence of their imp the influence of their powers on man, on their society. Well, they could, they were in a position to exercise power, to exercise their influence, and this is how they constituted a sort of authority. Now, this very broadly explains the origin, the historical origin of state. You can call it historical contextualization of the state, the way the state historically emerged in the uh, ancient period of human civilization. But when we are talking about state in the context of political science, we have to also be familiar with certain theories explaining the origin of the state. These theories are many. But modern study of political science, modern study of political theory, it suggests that very broadly speaking, these theories can be divided into two categories. On one level, the birth of the state has been traced to God, that is a divine, a theological explanation of the origin of state. The other is the human factor. First of all, let us try to understand the theological explanation. The theological explanation, which in fact uh, went down in history and which uh, in a way 
lasted for quite a long time, for centuries. In fact, in Europe till the end of the uh, 15th century, this explanation was quite valid. This explanation was accepted. That is, it was believed that certain sections of society, or rather, to be more exact, certain people, certain uh, elements in our in society, you can call them priests, you can call them uh, top officials of the church. Well, these people, they claim to be representatives of God. And not only they, there arose a situation where the, when the king, the monarch, the queen, they also began to claim that they are the representatives of God. And therefore, they exercise enormous power. Now, the implication was that first, you have to pay absolute allegiance to this authority, whether it is religious or it is non-religious. And second, you cannot resist, you cannot revolt against this particular authority. This is how the rule of the king and sometimes the rule of the people who control the church, well, this was absolutely justified. So this is the divine explanation. But more important, so far as the study of political science is concerned, so far our understanding, our analysis of the state is concerned, what is much more important is the human explanation. So far as the human explanation is concerned, there are again, very broadly speaking, two types of explanation. One explanation is known as the explanation based on the notion of consensus. There is another explanation which is believed to be a kind of understanding based on the notion of conflict. So there is a consensual explanation, there is a conflictual explanation. So far as the consensual explanation is concerned, this again very broadly speaking, is divided into several categories. In fact, there are several variations of this consensual understanding. One of the earliest type of understanding we come across in the writings of the great Greek philosopher Aristotle. Now, so far as Aristotle is concerned, Aristotle's understanding of state was like this, that state is a natural institution. Natural institution, it means that human beings by nature are social. Human nature, human beings by nature are inclined to live collectively. And therefore, it is this instinct of, say, coming together, which led to the formation of the state. This was the Aristotelian understanding. That is, there is a kind of consensus among us, among people living in society, that we require some kind of order, we require some kind of organization, we require some kind of authority so that we can naturally live in peace. This is a kind of, say, natural instinct which is latent in human beings. That was a typical Aristotelian explanation. There is a second explanation which is larger than uh, the Aristotelian explanation. This is generally known as the evolutionary or historical theory of the state. This evolutionary or historical theory, unlike Aristotle, does not attach importance to just one factor, that is the natural instinct. It tries to identify several factors. Now, what are these several factors? One factor, of course, is Aristotelian, that is social instinct. Instinctively, well, we are bound to or we are guided by the idea that we should live collectively. Second, there is the idea of kinship, that is a kind of blood relationship. Now, family family ties. This is another very important element so far as 
the evolutionary theory of state is concerned. Now, what is the importance of kinship? What is the importance of family ties? The understanding is very simple, that it is through the formation of family, it is in the institution of family that we come across the idea of order. We come across the idea of hierarchy. We come across the idea of loyalty. We come across the idea of obedience. Now, these are actually ideas which also are reflected in the idea of the state because the state operates by extracting obedience, by extracting loyalty. So discipline, loyalty, order, institution, it's a sort of institutional arrangement. Now these things are for the first time reflected in the setup of the family. The next important factor is religion. Religion again is an important factor that thing we have already explained. Religion in a way historically played a crucial role in the development of the state. Then there is of, of course force. States in history, they have emerged through wars, through conflicts, through violence. In fact, this thing we will discuss more in more detail in our next lecture. Then there is the factor which we can broadly identify as economic needs. Now what happened in the earliest days of human civilization was that different groups, say tribal societies, uh, different communities, well, they were in need of resources. Now suppose one particular group or one particular community, one very uh, small uh, uh, tribal community for, for example, well, for its survival, it requires resources. Another community, another society, another group, another organization also requires uh, this kind of uh, control over resources. And therefore, this leads to the notion of deprivation. The kind of resources that I require, well, that kind of resources you also require. And so, there is a problem of satisfying one's economic wants. That is, I have to serve my economic needs, you have to serve your economic needs. That leads to conflict, sometimes that leads to a kind of, say, cooperation. And this is how this, this kind of situation created the ambience for the growth of the state. Finally, political consciousness. This is another factor which in a way was a product of, say, interrelations among different groups. Sometimes political consciousness, of course, in a very, very rudimentary form, in a very elementary form, in a very unstructured form, political consciousness emerged, uh, howsoever uh, weak it was, it emerged as a result of interaction between different groups, sometimes through a relation of cooperation, sometimes through a relation of conflict. Finally, we come across the other variety of this consensual understanding of state. And that is broadly known as social contract theory. Social contract theory, it developed broadly speaking in 17th century Europe. Social contract theory is associated with three very important writers. One is Thomas Hobbes, 17th century. The other is John Locke, also belonging to the 17th century. These two were Englishmen. And the other is Rousseau, that is a Frenchman, a French philosopher of the 18th century. Very briefly speaking, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, all of them believe in two things that, that is common to Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. All of them believe that before the birth of state, men lived in a state of nature, a hypothetical state of nature. This hypothetical state of nature, well, has been constructed by three of these writers. They believe that they lived in a kind of state of nature. But the portrayal of state of nature differs uh, in the sense Hobbes's understanding, Locke's understanding, and Rousseau's understanding, they are not identical. That is one thing. And the second thing, which is common to Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, is 
the idea of a contract. The idea of a contract means that all of them believe, although their understanding is not identical, but all of them believe that Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, all of all these three philosophers believe that state is the result of a contract. Now, so far as Hobbes is concerned, the understanding is this, that men lived in a state of nature, in a and that state of nature was marked by violence, was marked by insecurity. And therefore, to come out of the sense of insecurity, which threatened them, they felt that they should sign a contract among themselves and create an absolute authority. And they would, for, the, for their own survival, in their own interests, they would surrender all their rights to that absolute authority, which Hobbes described as supreme and sovereign. So through that contract, an absolute power is created, and that absolute power Hobbes describes as state. So far as Locke is concerned, the understanding is somewhat different. Locke's understanding is, unlike Hobbes, the state of nature was rather peaceful. It was not violent. It was not chaotic, as we come across in the Hobbesian understanding. Locke's understanding is that in state of nature was peaceful, but there was one problem. The problem was that although it was peaceful, in the absence of order, the individuals were not sure of safeguarding, guaranteeing, securing their rights. So in order to protect their rights, in order to make their rights secure, in order to enjoy their rights properly, people in the state of nature decided, resolved, they felt that they should create an authority. And that authority would be the result of a contract. So they signed a contract and they formed a state. So state becomes, becomes uh, something which in Locke is absolute. State is necessary. But then, in Locke, we come across the idea of a second contract. The second contract is missing or absent in Hobbes. What is the second contract? The second contract in Locke suggests that people through the first contract created the state. Now through the second contract, they form a government. This government is the representative of the people. And the government actually is to secure their rights. The government is entrusted with the responsibility of safeguarding, ensuring their rights. So in Hobbes, there is one contract. In Locke, there are two contracts. Through the first contract, the state is formed. Through the second contract, the government is formed. Finally, we come across the ideas of Rousseau. In Rousseau, the understanding is that in the state of nature, people lived uh, broadly speaking, in a peaceful manner. But the difficulty is, Rousseau argues, that in the state of nature, what happened was, with the invention of private property, there developed inequality. And as a result, people became selfish. Therefore, Rousseau felt that in order to overcome the clash of selfish interests, which will lead to chaos, which will lead to anarchy, we require a state. And people formed the state, people formed a collective. This collective, in a way, is a moral collective. This moral collective is called the state. The purpose of the state is that they are, first of all, there is a clash of private interests. This clash of private interests, it has got to be neutralized. And therefore, above the clash, above these domain of private interest, there has to be a supreme body that is known as the state, which Rousseau argues represents the general will of society. If there is a clash between particular wills of individuals and the general will, that is the will of society, will of the people, then it is the general will which will prevail. With these words, we therefore arrive at the understanding of how the state 
emerged in the past and how the state developed primarily through a number of theories. These theories, as we have seen, these are of two varieties. That is theories relating to the origin of state. One is consensual, the other is conflictual. So far in this lecture, we have discussed the different varieties of the consensual understanding of the state. In our next lecture, we will discuss the conflictual understanding of the state. That is how the origin of the state has been explained in terms of the notion of conflict. Thank you.